So hi everyone, thank you very much for coming along to um, our Magnet Seminars. Um, it's another good turnout for our um, EU and Eastern Hemisphere uh, time slot. Um, so for those of you who haven't actually joined our seminars uh, before, um, we have presentations that are uh, on the order of about 30 minutes, give or take. Um, and we just kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones muted um, during the presentation so as not to disturb the, the presenter. Um, and if you are having problems with uh, your connection, if you try turning your, mic your microphone and your video off, that can improve uh, the connection. Um, after the, the presentation, we'll have a chance for a 10 to 15 minute um, question and discussion session. If you don't want to unmute to ask a question, you can just type it into the chat window. Uh, and I can read it out uh, for you. And as always, we've got life going on uh, in our background. So if you have to, to go halfway through the seminar, that's fine. It's not a problem, just, um, just get up and, and go. Uh, and once everything, once we've had our seminar finished, um, there'll be a chance for uh, a bit of a, a catch up at the end, because um, I think there's a few faces that, that not everybody has seen for quite some time. So we've got a bit of a social uh, at the end. And this part is, is not recorded, so um, it's a lot more uh, informal. So um, today I'm really pleased to say that we've got Andy Herries um, from La Trobe University in, in Melbourne, Australia. And today he's going to be talking about um, some of his work um, in, in archaeology and, and magnetism uh, in, in Africa. And so I will hand, hand over to you, Andy. Oh. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect. Okay, so um, Greg sort of asked me to do this a couple of weeks ago, so it's not going to be the, uh, so it was a little bit thrown together because I was on holiday uh, last week. Um, so this is sort of going to be a little bit of an overview of going back to some of my PhD data that I'm sort of beginning to revisit now that uh, I've been stuck in Australia for two years and unable to go to the field and go excavating. Um, I have been sort of head of department here at La Trobe um, in archeology span for the last three years. So I haven't really got very sort of near the lab uh, of late. So equally a big shout out to some, a lot of this work is the work of my uh, PhD students, Tom Mallett, who's just submitted his PhD for review and a site that um, uh, student Liz Topping is going to be working on, although she's currently sort of stuck um, back in England, unable to come uh, to Australia to sort of uh, get moving on her PhD. But um, in general, what I'm gonna talk a little bit about is um, the identification of magnetic reversals and magnetic events that occur sort of prior to the Olduvai uh, subcron and a little bit about the end sort of reversal. Um, so I shall sort of like cycle through some of that. So the two sites I'm mainly gonna um, talk about when it comes to the sort of more recent data is Kilombe Caldera, which is in Kenya, which is um, a series of excavations run by the archeology span department at the University of Liverpool. So I've been involved with that site sort of since about sort of 2010 working at some sites on the outside of the caldera and then some on the inside of the caldera, which is sort of quite an interesting, very, very pretty site. Um, and then the site of Drimelin Cave, which I run excavations at in South Africa, which as you can see there, doesn't look much like a cave anymore, but we'll sort of, I'll go through sort of um, all of that sort of thing. So as far as, you know, what I do, I mean, I'm mostly, I'm an archeologist. I run excavations at sites. That's one of my hats. And then the other thing is that I've, you know, for the last 20 odd, years been dating early uh, human evolution uh, hominid fossils and archaeological sequences so i've mostly worked in south africa but i work a little bit in eastern africa so if we look at the sort of dating of human origins in eastern africa um, a lot of the fossils you find in sediments that sit between various type, types of volcanic tuff and other um, volcanic layers which can often be argon argon dated um, at quite high resolution depending on you know um, how quick stuff was deposited. In some cases, you have uh, chemical fingerprinting is used rather than direct dating. And magnetostratigraphy is, um, you know, sometimes used, sometimes not used in circumstances probably where it would have been really useful to use it when I see a lot of papers. Um, 
and you know it's often just a you know a block of a block of black and a block of white and not a lot of data sort of included in the papers a lot and often the reversals are in quite sort of low, low resolution so you can see a site here which is in eastern um, eastern Lake Turkana in northern Kenya which is something I did uh, know, about 10 years or so ago now and you can see that it's sort of the bottom of the Alderby um, but the switch between the actual reversal is really just it just flips like that in the sort of sequence even if it's done at sort of relatively high resolution there's a few sort of older little flips um, that you know could be things but it's just the one odd sort of uh, direction sort of facing the other way so it's really hard to sort of say um, you know this is sort of an example of another one that could before in Kenya so you can see here that there's, you know, perhaps the suggestion of something else going on towards the end of the old divide, but again, it's just sort of a single sort of couple of samples and it's often not sort of well refined. And so this is what we often see in the sort of published sequences for the sort of region. Um, in some cases you can get some sort of higher resolution stuff, but um, so Kilombi Caldera, um, so it's in the central rift valley of Kenya. Um, so a little bit sort of quite a bit further south than Lake Takana. And as I say, it's a sort of unusual sedimentary sequence. So you can see this is looking from the uh, main site at Colombe, which is around about a million years old, looking towards the actual uh, Colombe volcano. And you sort of travel up over the crater rim and into the middle where there's a little, little village. Um, and there's a whole load of sequences that are um, that have been uh, deposited in there. So it would seem that the, the oldest deposits have been argon argon dated to around about sort of 2.5 million years. And then there are a couple of other argon argon dates, one which was around about 1.81 million years and one that was around about 1.76 million years. So um, we knew sort of immediately that we were around sort of the area of the upper part of the older via subcron, but had the sort of potential to be able to sort of move down through the sequence, hopefully, and sort of build up a record of that, so all those sort of transitions pre the old device sort of subcron. Um, this is using the, um, the sequences as published by Singer in 2014. So, or his geomagnetic instability time scale, as he calls it. Um, so this is sort of a project that's going to be done by Liz Topping, but Liz, as I say, has been sort of stuck out of the country. So I've sort of been doing some preliminary work on it and you know this is very very preliminary it's very thrown together um but we've got a few more argon argon dates so this is actually sort of the exposure of the sequences so it's actually sort of a road sequence but there's all of these masses tons and tons of different volcanic layers that sort of um that are exposed across this road cutting and then there's another road cutting and then there are some other exposures exposures which are in the middle of the the farmer's fields and we're still sort of working out how all of these different exposures sort of fit together. But um, this sequence also has sort of um, a change from what's called older one technology, which is this early technology that starts around about 2.6 million years ago. Um, and the beginning of a Shulian technology, which sort of comes in from about 1.8 million years. So from an archaeological perspective, we're sort of trying to understand when does that transition happen sort of in this sequence. So I did a preliminary field season in 2018 where I took sort of relatively coarse, coarse sort of sampling. Um, and now that sort of I know that probably this entire sequence is sort of formed over um, probably not much, you know, maximally probably, um, you know, uh, what is it? it's probably maybe, maybe 160, 180,000 years or something like that. Um, I'm gonna have to go back and do it in sort of high resolution. Uh, so the older one sort of layer itself, um, we're sort of appearing to be potentially very lucky here in that it sort of sits just below this argon argon age of about 1.76, sort of plus or minus 0.02 million years. So we should be sort of pretty near the sort of upper older by reversal at that point. So it was really sort of a hunting expedition to go and see whether we could sort of find that. Um, so I sort of tracked down initially from the site and you can see that actually there's, there's, um, there's no clear um, normal polarity signal in this sort of part of the sequence, um, but there are these departures from the overall reversed sort of polarity that exists sort of in these lower layers. There is another sequence which 
is been dated to 1.81 million and that's actually got a normal polarity. So we sort of know that Olduvai is there and we appear to potentially have sort of something going on perhaps that's either happening in the reversal or a little bit afterwards. Um, and what we're going to be trying to do with this now is obviously try and uh, link those sequences up um, to see whether we can actually expand this out a little bit more, sample down further and see if we can get more of this evidence of sort of changing sort of polarity sort of across the across the sort of transition. So, I mean, if we sort of compare it against this one, which is published from Kusa et al in 2016, in Japan, you can see sort of, you know, some of the potential fluctuations that we could sort of be looking at sort of at this period. So this is just very preliminary data that I'm sort of throwing in there, but um, in a sense to people that work on magnetostratigraphy are a little bit more familiar with um, the East African sequences and understanding magnetic reversals and use for dating sort of there. So I'll sort of throw this in just to sort of set up how that sort of happens in Eastern Africa before I talk about South Africa, which is sort of what I've mostly worked on. Um, so we sort of flip sort of about, you know, 3000 kilometers south to South Africa. Um, there's a whole series of early human fossils that occur just outside of Johannesburg. It's about 40 kilometers northwest of Johannesburg in an area that they call the cradle of humankind. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site these days. And I've sort of been working here uh, basically ever since my master's back in uh, the late 90s. Uh, initially, I started work up a little bit further north about the, at the sites of Makapans Khat, which um, that's actually where some of the first uh, paleomag was done on these sites in the 70s by uh, McFadden and Brock, who sort of showed that, you know, you could get paleomagnetic signals from this material. Some follow up work in these sites near Johannesburg, particularly at Sturkfontein and Swartkrans was sort of done in the 80s and gave very, very mixed results that appeared to be all over the place. And, you know, it was considered that really perhaps we couldn't get um, direct, useful directional data out of um, some of that stuff. I sort of came along um, in the late 90s and sort of started looking at re-examining some of these sites. So this was sort of prior to when we really had a lot of radiometric methods that we could use on dating the sites. And to be honest, as a PhD student, um, I was measuring these things and I kept coming up with these weird, funny directions going left, right and center. And I thought I was going mad and didn't believe myself. Um, and then sort of um, Joe Kirschfink and other people who were here published some data sort of from Cromdry in 2002, which actually as a PhD student really helped me sort of like, I'm not going mad, this is a thing. So thank you for that. Um, and I basically sort of expanded my work out from like a pun start working at Stoke Fontaine and most of the other sort of sites as sort of time has sort of gone by. Um, so the sites themselves are quite unusual. So they're sort of they're caves, but they're what we call paleo caves, paleo cast. So this is the site of Drimmel and Macondo, which is one of the sites that we excavated. And this initially was just a little hole in the ground and then we sort of expanded it open and we've actually found this sort of entire area of the cave. But the cave is being completely de-roofed by erosion and then there's various secondary processes that have gone on and all of the sediments have been indurated. But that's sort of good for us in the way that it, we get these nice sort of sections through it that we can then use for doing um, sort of um, doing the sort of dating work and excavating the fossils, etc. So it's a rather unusual setting and you know, I was told sort of when I started my PhD that really it was sort of pointless trying to do paleomag on these things because they'd all be the same polarity and you wouldn't get any data out of them and you had no other methods of dating it. But what I began to find was I kept coming up with finding reversals in these sorts of sequences. Um, so actually sort of dating the sites is somewhat difficult. So you have the breccia deposits that most of the fossils sit in. Now, obviously this forms from collapse. And this is the type of material that people first started um, sampling for doing paleomag. But obviously, this is not a good medium for paleomag because the signal is not being set. You know, it's a collapse um, sequence. There's lots of clasks in it. And so it's no wonder that a lot of that early stuff was actually giving these randomized directions. These days, we can try and date these deposits using electron spin resonance on teeth, although the plus or minuses on that are a little bit large. Cosmogenic barrel dating, which dates quartz, which 
um, has its own interesting problems. Um, but you do get these beautifully laminated siltstone and sandstone sequences, which is a, what, a lot of what um, McFadden and Brock sampled when they were at Makapanskat. And certainly this is the sort of stuff that we generally tend to target in the sequences. And these are all lateral variations to the breccia anyway. So they're sort of dating the same sort of time period because this stuff is winnowed from that entrance breccia. So we can date this with paleomagnetism, cosmogenics, and there's teeth in there, electron spin resonance as well. And then we get the speleothems themselves. So um, the speleothems uh, in general, as long as we can work it, you know, they often form as these big basal speleothem deposits and we sometimes get capping units and sometimes they occur in between. We have to be a little bit careful that we don't, that we know that they formed in the sequence and aren't secondary. And that's caused a lot of sort of debate. And we can do paleomagnetism on them. The remnants that we get from the paleo from these are always excellent, much better than the sediments, unless they're very, very weak. Um, and now they can also be directly dated using uranium lead. So when I sort of started um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uranium lead couldn't date this stuff. And so I was flying a little bit blind as to what I was seeing. But now we can actually go and directly date this stuff. And Robin Pickering, who's now at the University of Cape Town, came and did a sort of PhD a little bit after me, dating a lots of the sequences. And one of the beautiful things about it was that when we started taking these magnetic reversals and the uranium lead ages, everything began to pair up. So it basically first showed what reversals I was looking at, but also helped to really show that, you know, the uranium lead was working really, really well and giving, you know, sort of ages um, as would be expected. Some of the first sort of sites, this was sort of one of the first sites I think that sort of I found one of these in. And most of the reversals that we find tend to be in the speleothem layers, these flowstone layers, because obviously they form over a longer period of time than the sediments do. The sediments probably form quite rapidly. So catching a magnetic in rever a reversal in them is a little bit, a little bit harder. Um, but this is one at Gladys Vale where we did have some electron spin resonance. And, you know, those ages were about 578 to 830. And we found in this flowstone, this reversal, which we could sort of show was the sort of Brunes, uh, Masayama Brunes sort of reversal in there. But a lot of this dating in this early date was done very coarsely. I mean, we just took the, you know, a block of samples and took a few samples and it's just normal and it's reversed. We don't have things all the way through the sequences, which is sort of what I'm trying to go back and do now. Um, there's this one, which this was originally done by, um, so, uh, by, um, University of Liverpool lab before I sort of started there. Um, and again, this is a sequence of flow stones. They didn't sample the sediments because of those 1980, that 1980s work where they thought that the data was gonna be sort of bad and wasn't worth sort of sampling. So they sampled the flow stones and again, found a number of sort of different reversals, including within individual sort of flow stones. Now this was originally back then um, correlated to the Gauss um, and sort of mammoth events um, because there was no other sort of dating methods to go along with it other than looking sort of at the fauna. This has been sort of a very important sequence because it has this skeleton, what's called little foot, which is the most complete early hominid skeleton of Australopithecus sort of ever, ever discovered. And there's a lot, this, 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 this one is given lots of different ages and has been sort of quite sort of controversial. Um, and then this is also at the site of Sturkfontein. So this is associated with this fossil here, which is called Mrs. Kles, which is one of the most sort of famous sort of fossils um, of Australopithecus africanus, this early uh, human ancestor from South Africa. And there were some old ESR ages done, um, but the ESR ages were sort of a lot quite all over the place and people didn't really sort of trust them. Um, but again, this is sort of a, a relatively thin flowstone. And this was one of the ones that I did sort of sample in a bit sort of more resolution. As you can see, there's a whole load. I apologize for the, the nature of this data. It's literally pulled from my PhD. Um, and we can see a number of fluctuations where we've got sort of the main sequence where the fossils is, is reversed. And in this sort of capping flowstone, we see a number of sort of fluctuating short sort of normal back to reversed sort of polarity periods. I sort of had a shot in the dark um, when I sort of did this, sort of suggested perhaps this was the reunion events um, around about sort of, you know, 2.1, 2.2 million years, which was partly based on sort of some of these sort of ESR sort of ages that have been done on the lower part of the sequence. Um, so sort of more recently, you know, Singer has published this geomagnetic instability timescale where he's tried to sort of um, 
put in you know the updated ages and showing this sort of quite you know potentially lots of different um reversal events and sort of subcrons sort of in this period prior prior to sort of Olduvai which both uh, is a good thing for us as archaeologists trying to date this stuff in the sense that we can potentially refine the age of stuff but is also a complete nightmare because we've got to know which one of these things that we're actually looking at and what I've begun to realize is that you, you know in the old days I used to just say it's normal it's most likely to be Olduvai because it's the biggest thing in that time period but beginning to find out that it's not really the case sort of anymore. Um, 2019, we sort of published this paper sort of in uh, Nature, which sort of set up the chronology for sort of the entire of the cradle region with uranium lead dating of flowstones. And what we began to find is that what we showed was that ultimately flowstones were forming in each of the different caves at exactly the same time period. So you could pretty much go and find a flowstone in one cave, a flowstone in the other and show that they formed at the same sort of time. Um, and a lot of these flowstones we found were actually forming around periods where we were getting reversals. So around about 2.61, 2.2, 2.1, sort of and, and then around sort of older vise. So, um, you know, there was a high potential and we'd already knew that there were some reversals in some of this sort of stuff. And so actually when we went back and say reviewed this and actually directly dated this sequence um, at Sturkfontein with uranium lead, we got an age of about 2.03 plus or minus 0.06, which pretty much suggests that these fluctuations are probably the Huckleberry Ridge, which is sort of dated around about 2.07 million years. Um, and then another site called Malapa, where we also showed a normal sort of reverse transition in a in a flowstone. Um, I have actually done this one in much higher sort of detail now. Uh, and again, same dates, sort of with uranium lead about 2.03, 2.02 uh, million years. So again, potentially suggesting we've got a flowstone forming in two different caves at the same time period with the same sort of Huckleberry Ridge sort of reversal um, or event sort of in it. Um, so if we sort of compare that versus, um, you know, some of the argon argon ages from Singer, it's sort of suggesting here, if we would take uranium lead ages, that those that sort of event might be a little bit younger than what's suggested by 2.07 in that. Um, so this is sort of going to be an interesting thing moving forward is comparing what we're getting from direct dating from uranium lead on speleothem versus what we're getting from sort of argon argon, for example. Um, if we go back to um, Sturkfontein into that lower deposit where there's the little foot spot fossil, the direct dates for um, uranium lead there come out at 2.24, 2.17. So that's sort of around the period of sort of the Fenny subcron reunion sort of period. Um, so again, you know, interesting that we're getting uranium lead dates, you know, su suggesting that these things are potentially smaller reversals rather than these sort of bigger periods of time. Um, uh, some sort of other stuff that's sort of thrown in sites that I'm sort of hoping to sort of go back to. So this was a site called Gondolin, which I sort of again did dur during my PhD. And again, in actual fact, the capping flowstone here had a normal to reverse sort of transition. Um, it's, there's no direct dating for it, but we sort of estimated the, based on the paleomagnetic sequence that that was sort of the end of sort of Olduvai. So I want to sort of try go back and sort of again sample through that and try and sort of get direct sort of dating on it sort of ultimately. So I can begin to sort of pin all of these reversals in all of the speleothem sort of down. And that's sort of what I'm sort of in the process of doing now really is trying to go back to all these sites or go back to all the samples that are sort of sat in the lab that I can sort of access at the moment and try and remeasure them in sort of higher resolution and begin to sort of We've got the uranium lead sort of dating sequence across the sort of cradle, but we're adding ESR ages and then the paleomag to sort of get a comprehensive understanding of both the dating of the fossils, but also identifying where magnetic reversals are sort of throughout these sequences and correlating them sort of across different sorts of sites. Um, and, you know, it's beginning to be quite a treasure trove of finding these sorts of, uh, you know, finding reversals in there that we can get data out of. Now, a lot of this was just done for dating purposes, pure dating purposes. I wasn't really looking at it in terms of, well, okay, what can this actually tell us about the behavior of reversals? Can it tell us that? Is the data sort of accurate for doing that? So 
um, Tom Mallet, my sort of PhD student, has been looking into that a little bit more and a lot more into, you know, what's holding the remnants in this material, um, because in some cases, um, you know, the stuff looks, uh, the, the mineralogy doing basic stuff doesn't look very different, but you get some that work really well and some that sort of the data looks sort of terrible. Um, so that sort of brings us to Drimelin, which um, is the site that I sort of run and excavate sort of now. So there's sort of two sites here. There's the main quarry, which is where all the hominids come from, which is the younger site. And then there's the Macondo, which is this that site I showed you sort of earlier on, um, which is a little bit um, older. Um, so I haven't done, I've got all the samples to sort of redo this. So this is, this is Drimelin Macondo. So we've got sort of a basal speleothem here that's dated by uranium lead to about 2.664. You can see it's got a little, quite a big plus or sort of minus on that. And, um, and then um, we've got a whole lot of sediments with fossils sort of overlying that. And then we've done ESR um, a little bit for higher up. It comes at about 2.71. So they're both pointing to a period sort of around that sort of 2.6, 2.7 million year sort of mark. Um, some very preliminary, I did some very preliminary sampling of this because um, it's hard to get samples out of this. So you tend to do sort of um, sparsely separated ones to see whether there's anything to look at there before you go and then sort of start trying to get uh, full sort of sequences out of it because it is, you know, it's a hard sort of rock um, material. And there's a lot of fossils in here. But we appear to have sort of normal polarity sort of in the bottom of the sequence and sort of reverse sort of in the top. So this was sort of one of the first ones where we were beginning to find, well, okay, we'll get, perhaps we can also find these reversals if we're lucky in the sediment sequences rather than just in the, um, in the speleothems, which potentially might give us some sort of higher resolution in these sorts of reversals. So I now have a sort of big full sequence of this in the lab, ready to sort of cut up and go back and sort of remeasure to sort of confirm our you know suspicions that this is actually the sort of um this is the gauss matiyama boundary at about 2.61 which i actually again i did find what i thought was that at a site at makapanska back when i did my phd but again i didn't have um any sort of dating work to sort of go with it at the time it was just a hypothesis dremelin main quarry um which you can see here it's called dremelin main quarry because um, lime miners came and mined out the stalagmites and stalactites and the basal flowstone from here in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and was used in the gold extraction process. So a lot of these sites have sort of been mined for the stalagmites in the past. And so that's done a couple of things. It creates problems because it disconnects stratigraphic sequences sometimes, um, but it also means we get access to um, areas where there's fossils in that we wouldn't have done if it hadn't been sort of mined out. At Drimelin, we're quite lucky because there's a whole series of in-situ deposits that sit against one wall of the Paleo cabin. So we have a complete sequence through from the basal speleothem all the way sort of to the roof that we were able to sample through. Um, sort of back uh, the first, it was, it's sort of been most well known for DNH7, which is this, uh, the most complete Paranthropus robustus skull ever discovered. This is sort of this weird side branch in our evolution that basically has these big jaws eating hard objects sort of foods. Um, and but then sort of more recently we excavated and we found in 2018 DNH 154, which is the most complete male version of that species. And in 2015 we found this little sort of juvenile cranium, which a DNH 134 that uh, we published in science uh, showing uh, it's the oldest evidence for Homo erectus sort of anywhere in the world. So again, this sort of work started in just sort of trying to date these fossils more than anything else. When I started here in 2010, there weren't sort of any dates for the site. Um, so as I say, we sort of published this in science in 2020, showing sort of that these three different species, Australopithecus sediba, Homo erectus and Paranthropus were sort of living in the landscape around the same sort of period of time. Um, and also showing that sort of at, at this sort of age, 2.04 to 1.95 million, which I'll show you how we got to that, is sort of the oldest example we have of Homo erectus sort of anywhere sort of in the world. The next oldest potentially being around about 1.9 in Eastern Africa, and then the very beautiful stuff from Dominici in Georgia, about 1.8 million years. 
So the sort of sequence sort of this sort of is just a sort of a simplified sequence on the back wall of the cave. Um, we have a basal speleothem, uranium lead dated to about 2.673 uh, million years. So it seems that this speleothem and the one up in the Macondo formed at the same period of time. It appears though that um, that would have formed when there was no there was no entrance to the surface. There's no sediment really in that speleothem. And it was probably half a million years before any sediments that were then actually came into the cave. So unlike Macondo, where they came in very soon after the speleothem formed here, they seem to have taken half a million years or so before they began to come in. DNH 134 sort of sits at a level that we have ESR dates of about 2.04 million years. Um, and then as we sort of track, and, and that's from laterally, there's reverse polarity, which makes sense as we sort of track up through the sequence in this one section called the Walls of Jericho, which was so named because when I was trying to take detailed samples for it, it nearly fell on me. Um, we found sort of reversed at the bottom and normal at the top um, when we first sort of sampled it. And then we sort of went back through and sampled it in sort of quite high detail and found there was sort of the whole sort of middle section sort of had this intermediate sort of polarity to it. Um, so again, sort of suggesting that we had, um, you know, sort of pretty good sort of resolution sort of through that, which is sort of showing this sort of uh, completeness of sort of what some of the data looks like. Some of it's beautiful. Um, some speleothems work really well. Some like this number F here, which is the basal one, which because it hasn't got any sediment in it is awful. Uh, <laughs> and it's obviously sort of, uh, we wouldn't trust that sort of data. Um, and this is some of the work that Tom's been doing um, on the sort of mineralogical sort of work. Um, all the data sort of suggests that, you know, it's being held by magnetite and probably magnemite, um, but there's a huge grain size range of very, very lots of ultrafine um, SP across to sort of SD magnetite. It doesn't appear to be any evidence of multi-domain and everything that we've sort of done. So there is a good potential recording signal there. It just appears that there's not a lot of it um, based on some other synchrotrope work that we've done that suggests an awful lot of the stuff that's there is sort of non-remnants bearing sort of uh, uh, phases and hematite in particular. So um, this is sort of the, the sequence, the walls of Jericho sequence, which you can see sort of on the right. And the sort of key to this is actually there's a little tiny speleothem layer that sort of runs through the middle of it. And um, we actually were able to get a date off that, but we can only date speleothem layers if they have very high uranium concentrations in them because otherwise it's just not enough um, sort of lead to basically measure because it takes so long for one to go to the other. So we were very lucky with this that we could actually date it. And that gave a date of around 1.96 plus or minus 0.11 million years. So with that date there, we had an ESR date that's a little bit lower that came out at around 1.97 million years. So we were very, very confident ultimately that this was the base um, sort of of Olduvai that we were sort of looking at here. And, the intermediate sort of section sort of is over, you know, one point sort of uh, 1.2 sort of meters um, of the section. And again, we did this in sort of quite low resolution and then came back sort of and did it sort of in higher resolution. And so this is sort of the sequence that we can see um, with the sort of swing across from um, reverse polarity sort of at the bottom with a bit of instability, a swing across into sort of normal, which um, is still sort of a little bit unstable. And you can see here, one of the things we also did, because there's a lot of question about, you know, are these speleothems uh, intrusive? Are they formed within the sequence? We did micromorphology to show, yes, it's actually sat in the sequence, but also we did the paleomag on it, showing that the flow stone has an intermediate polarity, like the sediment sort of above and below it. Um, and so is part of that sort of continuum across the, the base of um, the older by sort of reversal. Um, and this was sort of some stuff that Tom sort of threw together, um, sort of showing the reversal path uh, based on that sort of data um, and just sort of compared to some of the other sort of published reversal paths for the old divide base. And there's some similarity between that and um, some of the other um, sort of published uh, reversals, although not in sort of, we don't have it in quite as high detail as obviously some of the ODP stuff. Um, so ultimately, what I've sort of begun doing now is really trying to sort of, um, uh, I'm sort of trying to sample some of the other sections to sort of basically try and sort of track this sort of reversal sort of across the site so that we can continue to sort of constrain 
the fossils to show ultimately it appears that all the fossils we've sort of excavated so far sort of sit below this reversal so um, you know that's good because we can immediately say that the material is sort of older than 1.95 million years our sort of task now really is to sort of go back and try and work out well how far old how far back does it go um, you know, beyond 1.95, we have the ESR age of about 2.04, but it has a plus or minus on it. Um, that sort of suggests it's probably not older than about 2.28, but um, that's sort of some of the stuff I'm, well, when I can get back there, I haven't been there for two years now and I'm beginning to get a bit of cabin fever at not being able to excavate stuff, but um, that's sort of the hope for what we're gonna sort of continue to do there. And we're gonna do some other sort of cosmogenic work um, but this is sort of one of the first sites that we've really been able to show using ESR, using uranium lead and the paleo mag, that we can get these very good, robust, solid ages and that sort of we can get pretty good sort of resolution of the ages as sort of part of that sort of as well. So, so there's uh, 20 years of sort of bits and pieces of work here, but I'm sort of now trying to go back to it and really try to sort of drag the... Um, rather than just using it as a dating method, but using it to say, okay, well, how, you know, can we actually begin to show, direct date these reversals using uranium lead and compare it to other dating methods and also get higher resolution within these various sort of reversals and little sequences that we seem to get um, popping up sort of everywhere. So that's about my half hour. Um, this is my sort of wonderful team that sort of excavates the site of field school students that as I say, I'm really missing <laughs> my Drimmelin family in South Africa. And if anyone's seen what's going on in South Africa at the moment, um, yeah, it's um, not good. So but we're thinking of lots of our local collaborators at the moment. So um, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, there you go. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, we can give uh, Andy a, a virtual round of applause with the uh, Zoom reactions. Um, no, it's really nice to see just the, such a comprehensive uh, talk bringing together a lot of different themes and in particular I like the idea of really digging back through old data and getting new insights from it because that's the kind of stuff that excites me as well. Um, so we can open the floor uh, to, to, to questions. So if you have a question, you can just uh, uh, raise your hand or, or put it into to, to the chat. We have nobody with any questions at the moment. Un silence. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, there we go. Joe's got his hand up. Hi, Joe. You can, if you unmute, mute yourself. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I, I noticed on your fork diagram that there seemed to be a bit of a central ridge. Yeah. Do you think the magnetite might be biogenic? Um. Now you're asking questions. <laughs> um. So I have to say that the the uh, identifying the sort of mineralogy that's uh, holding a lot of these things has been the sort of trickiest journey of the last sort of 20 years or so of all of this, because um, when I sort of first started, certainly um, my advisor was very much of the opinion that this was sort of multi-domain magnetite and that the signals were not very good. And um, certainly when you, demagnetize some of this stuff it has really really big sort of overprints on it sometimes but the overprints don't seem very stable at all and it's a very sort of sweet spot for getting the sort of data out and it doesn't seem to matter what we do to it it comes out as being you know the different sites are very similar to each other but we do get very very different um, data coming from them despite this um, what it seems to suggest is that um, we've got magnetite and there's some of it is in a great grain size range that is holding a sort of signal, but there's not a lot of it. When we put the sort of stuff into a synchrotron, uh, you can even really see the magnetite. It was just all showing sort of hematite. Um, and so, and at certain sites like Makapan's cut, um, some of the sequences have these sort of really bright sort of pink colors. Um, that you know sort of suggests that there's perhaps a lot of diagenesis sort of gone on. I think that there is in some of the sequences certainly 
um, some biogenic input. Um, the rest of it, uh, but a lot of it, I think actually, we've got a lot of very, very fine grains, which I think comes from the fact that a lot of this stuff is um, very old and it is in a landscape that's being sort of repeatedly burnt and is producing this sort of like fine grain size that's being sort of washed in. A lot of the stuff is sort of colluvial origin. We occasionally get sites that have what perhaps is material that's being brought in from a more sort of valley bottom alluvial setting and that often has a little bit of a different um, mineralogical character to it ultimately. Um, Tom actually sort of went out to the US um, to IRM to do quite a lot of this stuff because um, my lab's not heavily set up for doing a lot of the sort of mineralogical um, sort of work. But. Well, I guess one of the reasons I'm asking is that magnetic bacteria are known to exist in soil and body environments. Yeah. Pedogenic magnetite is there. Hodgetola uh, Valley published a paper on that almost 30 years ago. But it's not been studied in terms of a source of yeah. fine-grained uh, <clears throat> magnetite and or magnemite. And yeah. that's I mean, where it's thing, coming from. It's not unexpected. Yeah, I mean, the thing that the yeah. other thing that I notice is that, you know, again, that, um, I mean, one assumes that it's the same source material that's in the speleothems as a contaminant, uh, certainly in some cases, but... The, when it's, the speleothem is always giving much better, more stable sort of signals, um, which probably maybe it's not undergoing the same sort of secondary long-term low temperature um, alteration that some of the sort of sediments have been as well. And I've also been trying to understand a little bit more about, um, you know, these caves are obviously cave sediments that have been indurated by speleothem, but so we're doing a lot of micromorphology to help us understand has that material been solidified in one sort of go or has it been solidified, perhaps decalcified and then re-solidified? Certainly in some cases, it appears that it's just sort of been, it's been indurated and it's sort of remained that way. In, in one other cave, a site called Haskha, I've actually taken sequences in two different parts of the cave and you can get slightly different, you get different data because one area has had some secondary sort of decalcification alteration to it and the other one hasn't um which again sort of shows how you know you have to be really careful when you're doing your sampling um to make sure that you're getting you know material that has been injured and not decalcified and altered in, in sort of any sort of secondary sort of way which of course when i first started doing all of this um you know i wasn't really looking for um ultimately but Excellent. Um, we can open the floor to some other questions if anyone has them. If not, I can certainly throw a couple your way, Andy. Okay, so I still see empty putting your hand up, so I'll jump in. Um, uh, I guess, so one of the things is that with, with some of the speleotherms and stuff that you have, it, you know, there's potential of getting um, high resolution information about the reversals. I mean, with the, the, the data that you have, um, are you able to say anything about the actual duration uh, of the reversals? Well, I mean, that's the big problem, um, you know, because obviously you can do that in younger speleothem because you can uranium thorium date them and uranium thorium is exceedingly accurate. Whereas the issue with uranium lead is that, you know, you date the speed, you know, if you date through the speleothem, all three ages are sort of going to overlap with each other. Um, so you can't use that method to actually refine the resolution sort of through it. You can really just, at the moment, date the speleothem and say, well, this is this reversal sort of thing. The one way of potentially doing it, um, so my colleague, um, Phil Hopley, um, who's in London, we sort of published a paper from one of the sites, but uh, the paleomag, unfortunately, in that speleothem was not great. But he um, he actually they actually he actually went and counted the sort of annual banding within the speleothem. So if you're able to sort of combine that methodology with the paleomag together, then potentially you would be able to sort of give get you know an annual. You say right, well these are annually banded um, sequences of formation. You could do it that way potentially. Uh, I don't know if anyone's done that, but in theory you could sort of do that. The one issue that there is, though, is that, um, you know, the, uh, there's not a lot of stalagmites in these caves. You know, stalagmites are the perfect medium for doing paleomag 
and getting those high resolution because they form at the drip point. So they get everything that's there. Whereas a lot of what we've got sort of left to work with are these, what can be massively thick speleothems. I mean, there are speleothems at Markopanskart that are like five meters thick, um, you know, um, absolutely massive. But the problem is that they are, you know, lateral parts of that sequence. And so if not every sort of drip sort of reach that far, um, you're missing sort of parts of the sequence. So it's also a question of identifying where you might have hiatuses in that and sort of knowing, you know, what you might have sort of missing. So I think in some cases, if you've got the right samples, it might be possible. In other cases, there's a, there's a few things that are sort of working against you um, sort of for that. And that's a problem equally, I think, when, um, I mean, the other way of doing it obviously is also when we, if we, I've got a student working on some of the speleothems doing stable isotopes, where we can obviously then also try and wiggle match the climatic sequences to, um, that will also potentially give us ideas of how, how um, quickly things have formed um, through the sequences. So, um, yeah, so there's a few ways of sort of trying to sort of uh, do it, but the other problem with that is often, um, and this is one of the things I didn't, I didn't speak about actually, which, um, the challenges of dating the stuff is that firstly we need areas of the speleothem that have not recrystallized the dolomites so these are caves that are formed within dolomites which means a lot of the speleothems formed originally as aragonite and then actually then subsequently recrystallized and altered to calcite so that can play havoc on those isotopes and dating um, so first we have to sort of find sequences where that sort of hasn't happened but one of the things that I was very curious about was, you know, what, what effect does recrystallization have on the magnetic signal? Um, and there was sort of this one site in Malapa, there's a piece of the flow stone at Malapa where I was able to sort of do this, um, where there's a sort of recrystallized part. And we stuck it sort of in the synchrotron here in Melbourne and sort of looked at all of the, where all the iron banding was in the deposits. Um, and one section of the speleothem was sort of had a, um, you know, normal polarity and the other part had a sort of jumbled polarity. And the actual reason for it is that during the recrystallization process, the, the calcite grains have grown and they've grown very large calcite grains. So what you had is originally very, very small grains. And then as they've recrystallized and they've grown large, they sort of pushed the inclusions up and around the calcite grain like that. So it's, it's basically randomized the magnetic signal because it sort of pushed it out um, like that. So, so I did a little bit of work on that, which again, I haven't, one of the many things I should sit there and publish at some point. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of some of the other sort of, uh, I suppose, challenges of maybe, you know, some of the things that you also need to look out for if you are doing work, particularly on these old stalagmites where these sorts of things have sort of happened. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, if anyone has a hand. Uh, so we've got uh, uh, Tia Bodu uh, from China, I assume. If you want to unmute, you can ask a question. Uh, uh, Tia Bo, I can we cannot hear you. No, I'm afraid we... Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think we can hear you now. Oh, great. Andy, thanks for your talk. And uh, uh, since your paleomagnetic results from the South Africa, I'm thinking about that recently that uh, uh, there are some studies claim that the South Atlantic alumni has been at least in the, in the South Africa area for tens of tens of millions of years. Mm. So, uh, so I saw you also compare your VGP movement with other results. So have you considered about the, the inference of, of SA since it has already been there for tens of millions, millions of years? Uh, I would say, I mean, the issue is, I, I mean, I just don't have the data to um, actually do anything. We're comparing that sort of thing at the moment, really. So. Um, obviously, I think sort of as we collect more, I mean, certainly, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting thing to sort of um, sort of look at once we actually begin to get 
um, some more high resolution sort of through these sort of sequences sort of finished. But at the moment, I don't really have the data to um, do the compare, do anything like that. So, yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks very much. That's a really kind of interesting question and an interesting uh, thing to think about um, just how much of an influence that kind of thing might have uh, on the records. Um, but I think I'll sort of um, draw, draw it to a, a, a close there. And thank you, uh, everyone, for, for your questions. And thank you, Andy, again, for uh, a really great talk. And just before um, we draw everything to a complete close, um, just want to, to give a little um, reminder of people um, for uh, our upcoming schedule. So in a couple of weeks time, we'll have uh, Claire Nichols uh, from Oxford giving us a presentation. And then uh, a couple of weeks after that, we'll have Dave Heslop from Australian National University. And then we'll have a, a, a short break for uh, the IAGA meeting so that we are not um, overlapping. And then we'll come back in September um, through to the, to the end of the year. Um, we've filled in our schedule uh, up towards the end of the year. So uh, if anybody's interested in giving a presentation, we're, we're opening the schedule now for uh, 2022. And as always, we're really keen to encourage uh, early career uh, researchers to, to uh, promote themselves, promote their research um, through magnets. So if anybody is interested in um, giving a presentation, please just uh, uh, reach out to us. Um, and uh, a reminder that um, all the, the recordings from our previous seminars are available through Earthref as well as our uh, YouTube channel. And I just want to thank Andy once again and thank everybody for uh, coming to Magnus this week and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you all very much.